And good evening, folks. Welcome to uh, this week's live stream, uh, live from in studio. Uh, it's great to have you all with me uh, again, and uh, it's been great seeing so many people in the chat even beforehand. Uh, I think uh, there was people in there half an hour in advance, which has got to be a record. And uh, there seems to be a bit of competition to be uh, who's who can be first in the chat. And the prize winner this week is Kev Pack. Right. Anyway, that's um, that's a slight aside. So. What's going on with the show? What's what's it all about? Um, let me get the slides. Hang on, something really weird happened there. I tapped to advance my slides and I ended up with a Lightroom screen coming up on the other monitor. That's really, really weird. Right, let's see if I can get... Yes, they are, so they are advancing. Good grief, technology problems already. Right, let's um, just explain about the shows in case there's anybody who hasn't seen one of these before and is watching it either live or on the replay. These are weekly shows, 7.30 each Sunday night. And this is number 21, I think. 21 today. And um, it's been going, been going for a while, and I keep them online on my YouTube channel for a while. The aim is that they will get cut down. Uh, that will happen eventually. It's just taken me a while to do it. I've had um, other things to distract, distract me this week, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, eventually, the full versions will go into the Academy, and extracts will be... Uh, put on the appropriate channel. So if it's travel related, it'll be on my travel photography channel. If it's Lightroom related, it'll be on the Learn Lightroom channel. And if it's anything else, it'll be here on the In Studio channel. So the, the extracts go on to the, the most appropriate place after that. So if you want to track those down, then do subscribe to all the different channels uh, that I have. You'll find links to them in the margin on the home page for uh, the In Studio channel. Uh, there's a link through to uh, the travel channel and travel photography channel, I should say, and one through to the Learn Lightroom channel. Do ask questions in the, uh, in the chat, in the live chat, if you are watching this live. If you're watching this on the replay, ask any questions in the comments there. I do respond to them all. I do follow up on them all. Um, and uh, I will, if it's questions uh, that I can answer in the next uh, live stream, I do so. As ever, please subscribe to the YouTube channels. It does help me and it helps you as well. It helps you uh, know when the new live streams are coming up and what they're all about and other videos which are being posted on there. Please comment on the videos as well. If, if you enjoy it, let me know. Post it in the comments uh, if you're watching this on the replay or if you're watching any of the other videos. Those comments really help me find the direction that I need to go with the, with the channel so I can provide the videos that you're looking for. And like, like. I say this every week. Do like the live stream. There's 16 of you watching at the moment, according to this, and only three of you are liking it. That means 13 of you haven't liked it yet. Go on, go and hit that like button, please. Right, and if you know anyone else who would like to watch these streams, please share the links to them, let them know about it. Uh, the number of, uh, of viewers is growing steadily, but it could do is growing a little bit quicker if, uh, if we can manage that. Still looking for images for the three minute Lightroom edit and uh, haven't had any new ones recently from people who haven't had them done before. So uh, yeah, I'd like a few more rather than um, the old faithfuls. Not, not, got nothing against the old faithfuls and we've got some really interesting images uh, in there and some quite interesting ones coming up. Tonight's a little bit different. It's one from Gary. Uh, so we'll see what you make of that one when it comes up. Uh, volunteers for our photographer showcase. We've had two of them so far uh, with Kev and with uh, David Jones, which is just a look into the work that they're doing uh, on that. Uh, 
Right, uh, yeah, Facebook groups. In case you're not aware, I have a Facebook group which is now getting quite closely tied with this live stream. You'll find the link here. Uh, go and join it. Uh, that's the place during the week where I post questions, try and get people to share images which feed into the live stream on a Sunday. We're trying to build a bit of a community about this so that uh, I'm interacting with you. It's not just me sitting in an empty studio uh, talking out into the ether. Uh, this could be a, uh, a, a should be a three-way, three-way, two-way conversation uh, on there. So please share your photos in there as well. We're talking about foreshortening. We're talking about distortion as in using distortion within creatively in our images and bokeh tonight. So if you want to share any images in there, I'll go during the live stream, I'll go and have a look at them at the end and uh, uh, we'll see what's on there. I've had a few already and some of those I'll be talking about later. Right, I also have a newsletter. Uh, the link's down below in the uh, video description. So if you want to subscribe to that, didn't, didn't manage to get a newsletter out today. Uh, it's been a bit of a busy week. Uh, I've thrown off balance a little bit earlier in this week um, and it had a bit of a knock on effect. For many of you know, I do work for a, a cruise line and uh, I have been spending a reasonable proportion of my year uh, on board ships. And that cruise line that I work for went into administration earlier this week. So that was a really big blow. Um, I mean, I, it's devastating for myself because that's, it's part, while I don't get paid for it, it's part of my business plan. And not only that, there are, I have friends on the ship and I know that there's quite a few of those people because I'm not going to be going back to the ships, I'm not going to see again. And so it's hard. But more than that, there's 4,000 people lost their jobs. People who work on the ships, work in the, the shore operations and that, uh, the land side of things. So yeah, it sort of knocked me a little bit. That set me back. Uh, but I also had other things that had to be done this week, which I'm going to talk about shortly uh, on there. So what have we got on the show this week? And I have a nasty feeling I didn't update this slide. So this might be saying what's on the show last week. We've got the news item. Yeah, no, not focal length and crop factor. It's, um, it's distortion and foreshortening. And three minute challenge, yes. And instead of the right lens, it's going to be bokeh in that slot. We'll look at some of your images and I've got feedback and live Q&A in there as well. Well, here's the big news story for me this week. Ian Studio is back. And this was the other thing that's been uh, keeping me busy this week because I've now made the studio, well, I won't say COVID safe because nothing is, uh, but uh, I've made it in a format that will help us reduce or mitigate some of the risks for, uh, uh, for COVID. And what you can see behind me is a very distorted uh, pano that I created on the phone to show the, the, the setup. Everything in the studio has been pared back. So the, the famous red sofa is now hiding away in my office, which is now uh, even more of a storeroom than it ever was and is out of bound to, bounds to visitors because that is an area I can't I can't manage in terms of uh, wiping down and disinfecting after people have been in. The main studio here uh, around me has got a very limited number of seats. They are the hard seats so that they can be wiped down. There's tables. I can keep people uh, a meter and a bit apart. Um, I can have up to three photographers, one model and myself, in the studio, keeping one meter separation. So that means everyone's going to have to wear face masks in the studio, the exception being anyone who is being photographed on set. Uh, but the rest of the time, it's face masks, I'm afraid. But I will be running some more events. For those of you who are local, if you're interested, 
let me know. The first one, I want to find the photographers before I run the, run the event, and I want to just trial the procedures and everything before I start advertising uh, regular events again. But the good news is we're back. I can do studio hires. They have certain restrictions on us uh, with um, studio hires about what people can do. Uh, the changing room for models has been, uh, again, paired right back. Every, uh, everything is boxed up in there so things can be cleaned up afterwards. So we are back. That's the important thing. So if you're looking for, for a studio for any work, uh, for a studio hire or just for fun, then do get in touch because we are operating again. And I just wanted people to know that. I'm going to be releasing a video. Um, I was hoping to do it today, but I didn't quite manage to get it done in time, which is a tour of the setup and uh, explaining a little bit about what's changed. So watch out for that. That'll be coming up on um, YouTube this week. Right, Q&A, Q&A part one. If you've got questions, do stick them in the chat. I'll try and deal with them, um, if not now, in part two. There is a delay, so the fact that I'm saying this now, you're not going to hear it for 30 seconds, which means it's going to take you a while to type in. So I might even have moved on by the time you get your question in now, which is why I have a part two at the end where I'll pick them all up uh, on that. Uh, if you've got questions during the week, please uh, email them to me. Uh, my uh, public email address is contact me at ians-studio.co.uk and I will try and deal with them on the show or wh whatever is appropriate on there. Or you can post them in the, uh, the Facebook group. I'll pick up uh, questions from there as well. That's why I say, I'll pick up questions from wherever I can get them for the live stream. So just get in contact with me. I had a question from Bill during the week. It's too long for me to actually read out. It was quite a long email he sent me. But the, the gist of it was that he's joined a private uh, Facebook group. Uh, it's one of these about a locality. I, there's ones around here. I, suppose, I know they're, they're all over the different areas, but focusing on perhaps the history of a location, something like that. And he spotted within that group uh, some photos that have been po uh, posted there, and they've been taken from various places online, uh, copied and um, reposted within the, the private group. And the reason Bill was asking about this was because three of the photos, one of them was one of Bill's images. It was uh, an image that he'd sold through Alamy, uh, so it was being used legitimately online, but somebody within the Facebook group had um, taken the copy off where it was being legitimately used and re um, reposted it. The other images, one was um, taken by his by his mum, and the other was taken by somebody else that he knew. Um, so they're not actually Bill's images, but the, the copyright lies with, uh, with someone else uh, on that. And his question to me was, should he really report this to Facebook? Is anyone going to take any notice? Is it going to cause problems, etc.? cetera? How, how to handle this sort of um, scenario when it comes up? And I think it's a very tricky one, this. And there isn't a straightforward answer on this. Yes, they're breaking copyright. Yes, Bill, you would be entirely within your rights, particularly with your image, to contact the owner of the group and demand it be removed. The chances are, as I think you mentioned in your email, that they might just then ban you from the group and carry on anyway. Uh, so would that work? Or do you just report it to Facebook? In which case, they might guess who's actually reported it. And same thing again uh, on that. What I would do with that sort of scenario is I would contact the admin for the group. And I would say to them, Look, 
I'm really honored that you want to show images that, in, in the case of one of yours, uh, that are mine or my relatives or whatever. I'm honored that you want to do that and uh, perhaps suggest that there might be a, another way of achieving what he wants for the group and what you want to protect the copyright. For example, the one of yours which is being used on another website legitimately, what he could do with that group is instead of taking a copy of it, he could just post a link to the website of it. And by doing that, you can end up, you can have the image in the group, but it's actually just a reference to uh, the website, which means there's no, there's no copyright being broken on that. It's just referencing it. It's pointing to where it is. The other thing you can ask for, Bill, with that is to say, look, would you mind at least giving me a credit on these uh, to, to say where they are uh, or a link back to where you've got them from? and ask for that. And I think most people, if you approach them with something that isn't, isn't just, I want that removed, are probably going to be a bit more receptive about this, uh, about this sort of thing and are likely to, uh, to respond. Now, you don't know. They may just go, huh, and uh, take no notice of, uh, at all. If you feel that they are deliberately being awkward, deliberately don't want to listen, don't want to compromise, then you could try reporting it to Facebook. In terms of images from Alamy, I did try reporting one to Alamy, try and get them to do it because uh, it was one of my images that had been lifted directly from Alamy uh, that had been was being used, and Alamy didn't want to know. So there's no point going that route. How much, um, how far you would get with Facebook? I honestly don't know. So sorry that it's not an easy answer to that, but I would I would go through the route first of all, talking with the admin on there, and um, just say a private message, not public, just saying, would you mind doing it this way? Hope that helps, Bill. That, that's all I can say. Right. Um, right. We've got uh, what looks like a question in here. Oh, from Michael. He says, how are people finding wearing face masks? What are your thoughts on using masks during outdoor shoots? Right, okay, uh, let me give my thoughts uh, on that one, face masks. Right, they are, uh, in my studio, because of the space, unfortunately, they are compulsory. I don't like wearing them, and some of you may have seen that I had a bit of an anxiety attack over it um, a week or so back. Uh, I, I just, late at night, one of those sort of late night things, trying to get to sleep, I was just sort of, panicking over face masks, thinking, can I do my job? Um, well, my solution, and I know this doesn't work for everyone, is contact lenses. When I'm shooting or when I'm having to wear a face mask, I'm wearing, uh, wearing contact lenses because my problem I have is that my spec will mist up. When I did my shoot, I had did my first portrait shoot in the studio uh, Friday with a client. I worked with contact lenses. That all worked fine. The problem was that the viewfinder on the camera steamed up, misted it up. And so I, it was a case of shoot, 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 shoot. And then I'd have to take, move the camera away, let it demist for a moment. Now, for me, that's not a big issue because I tend to be uh, a shooter who shoots, shoots a couple of shots and I'm, I'm not constantly going click, 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 like that, as uh, I know uh, many people do. So I tend, tend to work in that sort of way. Uh, so that, that's fine by me. Outside, no. 
I, I, I don't see the need outside, unless you're getting very close to people uh, on that. Um, so it's got to be down to where it's needed. Um, the, the problem is it's not nice wearing face masks. None of us like wearing them. I tend to wear, well, I use the term face mask, but I actually don't really mean that because what I normally wear is, uh, they're referred to as a, a buff or a snood. It's these sort of uh, material uh, loops that go around your neck and you can sort of just pull them up. And I find that works really well for me. I find them comfortable to wear. Um, and yeah, they still cause things to mist up. I do have the proper paper ones in the studio. And if I'm doing uh, any, any length of time here that I need to wear one, I will probably start with the snood and then uh, move over to the, the paper ones on that. But outside, I would, do, I would, use, the, um, I would use the snood rather than paper ones. And I find it works for me. Um, it's um, If we're getting closer than two meters to people, then yeah, you should wear them. But the risks are reduced outside. Um, so uh, that's that. Just looking at the various comments on he, uh, on uh, online. Um, yeah, using common sense. Uh, Dimitri saying, yeah, the buffs are great. They are. I, I actually went to go outdoors earlier today and bought three more so that I can wear one for just one day and then put it in the wash so that I know. I, it, it occurred to me, uh, I had a slight problem right, because once you take them off, mine are the same inside and out. And I don't know which way round, which was against me. So if I put it back on, I might be putting the bit that was exposed against my mouth, which is the complete opposite of what I want with it. So I, I bought three more today. I'm really pleased with them uh, on that. And they work well for me um, on that. Um, yeah, it, uh, Peter is saying in France, it's wear them in public places or receive a fine. Yeah. Um, here, it's only inside, basically public places inside. So I'm live, I, Sunday mornings, I work with um, the church I go to to stream their services and we have to wear face coverings in church. Now, when I go in to do the live streaming, even though there's only a handful of us in there, we still have to wear them uh, on that. So necessary evil, I think, is the, uh, is the thing. Right, anyway, you've, you've heard enough from me for the time being. Let's move on to our Lightroom three minute challenge which is, if you don't know, I have three minutes to edit uh, an image, uh, sight unseen, more or less, and uh, I challenge Rick to do the same. So we'll start off with Rick's edit, as we normally do, but my usual plea, I need some more people to uh, send us images for this. Um, we've, got, we've had lots of different types now, so the note about nice to have some non-model images, doesn't really apply anymore because we've had a lot of, um, of others. Uh, when we started out with this and I created this slide, everything was model images. And I just felt we needed a bit of a change uh, on there. So if you want to supply something, there's one or two of you who haven't submitted, do, do let me, do get in contact. It'd be nice to have some images from you. So Rick's edit. So here we go. I'll be back in a few minutes. Good evening and welcome to another Lightroom edit challenge. Uh, my name's Rick Bradbury. I'm recording this for Ian's upcoming live stream or tonight's live stream that you are watching. And for this one, we have an image from Gary Platt. I think this is image number three of his. So thank you very much for sending the images in. And we shall jump into Lightroom in a moment. So we'll get the timer ready. Three minutes on the clock. Oh, um, we have a new badge for the Pixapro Partner Studio status. Um, I've got some news coming from uh, Pixapro soon. I'm waiting for some further details to be ironed out. So who knows, we may be announcing that on an upcoming live stream soon. Um, but for now, let's stop yabbering on and jump into Lightroom. So we'll go three minutes on the clock and let's go. Boom, there we are. 
So this is a raw file, no XMP imported, um, and it's been reset. So we will do lens corrections because it was there to click on. And we will go Adobe Standard. Uh, let's see what we've got. So we've got a um, cityscape or a graphic image, if you will, of buildings, um, which they always make for very interesting shooting buildings and office buildings, in particular if they've got quite interest elements to them. Um, obviously reflections are really interesting. So let's see what we can do with this. Uh, exposure down just a tad. I'm going to go straight to curves uh, rather than global contrast just to give it a little bit more bite. And shadow wise, don't really want to flatten the shadows or increase the shadows out because I don't really want to see what's in the offices, um, to be honest with you. Uh, not all that interested in that, um, but we'll just do a little bit, a little bit on the black levels. Some global contrast, um, just a tiny, oh, don't want to go too far because uh, yeah, that just looks awful. Um, so just a little bit there and probably a little bit further on the curves. Now, does this work in black and white? I don't think it will, but um, easy way to note. Right, okay, so let's not do black and white. So pump up the whites just a little bit. It's a bright sunny day. I expect to see that kind of a snap and look to it. Uh, highlights, there we go. Speaking of lights, there's the office lights in there. Like, how bright are they that we can still see them through those dark windows? Anyway, right. Um, let's see. Don't need noise reduction. It was shot at ISO 100. And it was shot on, oh, I forgot to mention this, um, a seven, uh, 24 to 70, a 70 mil at f2.8, 2,000 of a second, ISO 100. Okay. Um, and it was shot on a Sony something or other camera. Um, I've not got Lightroom to tell me that bit of information. Um, not that important. Right, so let's finish this off. Okay, maybe a bit more contrast and probably um, a little bit less because it seems to have a bit of a magenta cast to it. Um, there we go, that's normally a Canon trait. And I'm probably going to warm it up just a touch. And then we're going to go to sharpening because there's 26 seconds left on the clock. Oh my word. So masking, detail, radius. Um, increase that. Let's go. Ooh, not that much texture. Clarity, no, don't need that much. That's a look HDR. And a little bit of dehaze. And I'm going to call that good. Six seconds left. There we go. Um, so from before to after. Before to after. Sure, sh sure. No, don't start another one. Oh my, what am I doing? What am I doing? Right. So before and after. So we've got the lens corrections, contrast, a um, little bit of a white balance touch. Uh, and we are good to go, obviously some detail and sharpening as well. Um, not too sure where this is, the buildings don't jump out or I don't recognise them. If it's in Manchester, it's been a while since I've been into Manchester to be fair, so I wouldn't necessarily recognise them. Um, but do let me know um, on the stream um, where this was taken. So thank you very much um, to Gary for sending that in. Um, I'll be back shortly with some feedback on this image and for now we'll head back to the studio. It's not like a news reporter, we'll head back to the studio to Ian. <laughs> right, and back in the studio. Thanks, Rick. Right, okay. Um, yeah, it was the first time I watched that through. That was in interesting, uh, Rick's edit on there. Um, yeah, I'll see you yeah, when, when we get to mine. Right, okay, so our topic for tonight, distortion and foreshortening. Um, this is, um, I don't know whether I'd say beginner level, intermediate level. It's... Um, the sort of thing we sometimes don't talk about, but just let's think about it. I know we've got one or two people on here who are more beginner level, so hopefully you'll find this helpful uh, on here. And we're picking up where we left off uh, last week, where we were talking about different focal lengths and how we use them. Um, and what I want to start with is showing the effect that different focal lengths have uh, on our um, uh, on our images. So let's start with an image of a model shot at 300 millimeter. One, for, yeah, uh, uh, but at 
and then we'll go through it at different um, um, focal lengths. What I want to say about this is the thing to notice about it is how the subject's nose appears very small. It's very sort of button-like nose on there at 300 millimeter. Then if we go down to 105 millimeter, now this we've gone for, from telephoto to medium telephoto now, and you can see on here, the reality, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> the reality of the model's features. Now you could say that that first image is quite flattering because it flattens the features down, but it's not necessarily a true representation. So 105 millimeter, 100 millimeter is a much more accurate representation of our subject. At 50 millimeter, we're starting to see a little bit of distortion coming in here. And for me, 50 millimeter, now do remember this is the 35 millimeter equivalent uh, focal length that we're looking at here. So if you've got a crop factor um, on your, uh, your lens, then you've got to multiply your actual focal length by the crop factor to get the effective uh, focal length of your lens. So that's what we're looking at on here. So the 50 millimeter is probably the limit of what I would use for this sort of head and shoulders type portraiture, because we're just starting to see a little bit of distortion come in there. Then you've got a lot more by the time we get to 35 millimeter and you can see how distorted that is. But if we go to 19 millimeter, that's just crazy. And if you tried doing portraits for a client looking like that, I don't think you'd get many sales. Yes, it's interesting. It's this, in this sort of caricature, distorted look, but it shows what it, it it is, it's introduced this distortion. So let's talk about this distortion and then we'll look at the foreshortening side of it. Um, so how can we use these effects as part of our composition? We can do particular things. And the first thing to say is that the lens does not create that distortion. The lens does not create the foreshortening. It's where we place the lens relative to our subject. It doesn't actually matter what the focal length is, but the reality is that you, you don't get the effect. Um, you only get the distortion on the wide angle lenses because those really are the only ones you can get close in and still get your full subject in. So let, let it's easier to explain with, uh, with images. This is Port El Cantawi uh, in Tunisia. And it's a popular tourist location, was, was a popular tourist uh, location. Now this fountain in the middle of the, uh, the tourist village there is big, but it's not that big. What I've done here is I've used a wide angle lens close to the edge of the fountain and it's made it look huge. It's made the buildings in the background look further away. So I've used it to enhance the size of the, uh, of the, of the, um, the fountain, make it look a lot bigger. It's exactly what I, effectively, that's what I'd done with that image I showed earlier on of my studio. It was all distorted. It made it look huge when it isn't. Uh, that's the effect of wide angle close up. Again, same sort of effect here with my cat, my late cat. Uh, it's distorted. He, if you look at the size of his head compared to the base of that sundial, you can see the distortion in there. But we can use that creatively. In the, the studio, I've got this effect of a, a model. It looks like a caricature. Her head is more or less the size of her body on there. So how was that achieved? It was an extreme wide angle lens. And believe it or not, I was very, very close to the model when I shot that. Um, I think that would be my 12 to 24 millimeter lens, if I'm not much mistaken. 
Might, might have been the 19 millimeter, I'm not sure. But the distance away from her head was about, ooh, about that much to get that effect. So we're really bringing the camera in close. Got to watch where you focus. Now, with extreme wide angles, you get a huge depth of field. So with this shot, I'm okay. I focus on the eyes. Right. Actually, I think I focused a little bit below the eyes, uh, believe it or not, with this, because I knew the depth of field was big, and I knew I could do that. And by doing that, because two thirds are beyond the focus point, it allowed me to get a little bit more of the body in sharp focus uh, with that kind of shot. Again, same sort of thing here with model Dante Layla. Um, by using a wide angle close in, it just gives this weird effect as she's uh, sort of in the corner um, uh, on this shot. Not quite as much, but it's still there with this sports shot. And uh, again, camera quite close to the hand makes the, the hand in the foreground look large compared to the, the face and the hand in the background. It creates that distortion, but it helps us tell the story of the image. It effectively makes the viewer appear to be in close on this shot. But what about the other way? So if um, distortion is using a wide angle or extreme wide angle close up, close to your subject, foreshortening is using a telephoto lens or medium telephoto further away. Effectively, you're zooming in on your, uh, your subject. And we can see here, it's made this line of gulls, which believe me, they weren't as close as they appear in this image. It makes them look as though they are one on top of the other. And if you look at the first gull and compare it to the, the second, the, the one at the back, they appear to be the same size. In reality, normally you would expect the one further away just to look that little bit smaller, but that's our foreshortening effect. The next image probably tells this story so much better. And uh, I, I talk about this image a lot when uh, I'm giving my talks um, on this subject. How close is that bus to the cyclist? It looks as though he's about to get mowed down by it. But then we pause and think, uh, if I, I've got my mouse, yeah. Just look, however, of how long is that bus? It makes that bus look really short. And same with that one. That's the foreshortening effect, using a telephoto lens for a long way back, and that effectively we zoom in on our subject and it compresses everything. Call it um, foreshortening or compression. Uh, in there. Now, if any of you watch or used to watch Coronation Street, we're going back to the 1980s here, but there used to be a villain in Coronation Street called Alan Bradley. And maybe some of you remember how he met his demise. He got mowed down by a tram uh, in Blackpool. And it was one of these quite famous um, demises of a, a character in a um, in a soap or in a TV series. And the scene actually showed him being hit by the tram. And they used this effect of foreshortening to actually film that sequence. I don't know whether it was the actor or a stuntman, I presume a stuntman, but what they did is they filmed the scene for a long, long way away and used a telephoto lens. So as the tram was approaching him, on the last minute, the stuntman acted as though he'd been hit by the tram and rolled out of the way of it. But the compression, the foreshortening, made it look as though the, the tram had made contact with him. So they used it um, in, in video, in television, that effect of making things look closer together than they actually are. So we can use it for compositional effect here where we just want to make things look close together in the columns. But we can use it to great effect to enhance our composition. And here's a, a really good example of it, which is in Duga in Tunisia. Uh, we've got the, uh, the capital in the background there. And I wanted to photograph it through this archway, which I did with a normal lens. And then I thought, I just wish that that 
temple, that capital building in the background, was closer so that it filled the frame of this, uh, this doorway. Well, you know what? I put on a telephoto lens and walked further away and then uh, created the image again. And this is what I got. I've just moved an entire building by using that technique of foreshortening. So it's a very, very powerful technique to improve our composition by making things come closer together that in reality aren't. So I use that quite a lot. You look at the scene, it does rely on being able to get further away. And that, that bit is quite counterintuitive because we tend to think, oh, we want it to look closer. We must get closer. In actual fact, if you want it to look closer, you go further away and, and zoom in. So let's just show you that effect again. That's the telephoto lens. That's a normal lens, about 50 millimeter. So normal lens is 35 to 70 millimeter, anything within that range as we looked at last week. So that's the normal lens. And then we just zoomed in and went further back and it just brought it so much closer. And that's the power of foreshortening. Right, on with the three minute uh, Lightroom challenge. This time it's my edit. So, have a watch of that and then I'll be back in a little over three minutes. Hello, welcome to another Lightroom three minute edit challenge. This time I've got an image supplied by Gary Platt. As ever, I have three minutes without uh, looking at the image beforehand other than pulling it into, uh, into Lightroom to actually edit the image. So let's set the timer and away we go. Right, so into the develop module with this. And we have a city abstract by the looks of it. Uh, right, I'm going to do a full reset on here because it's obviously got some data already in there. Right, so we're back to here. Actually, I'm just going to undo that and save that as a snapshot because I'll want that later. Um, Gary's edit. Great, try and ignore what he's done. Uh, reset, full reset. Okay, first things to do are always len lens corrections. So get those on there, then transform and get the uprights in there. Let's see what auto can do for us on it. Not too bad. It's slightly out on there. So just give it a little bit of a vertical tweak on that to bring it in on there so i think that's about right constrain to crop to get rid of those little white bits i think we're on okay a little bit underexposed in the mid tones there so let's just bring the exposure i'm keeping my eye on the histogram to make sure that doesn't go over right okay this is going to be one of those where i'm actually going to let the exposure come right up to get what I want, then bring the highlights long. Come on, slider. It's really not liking uh, working on this machine at those. But bring those back in on there. Bring the exposure down just slightly, I think, on that. Right, white balance. It looks a little bit blue to me. I'm just going to set it to daylight, see what that looks like. No, it appears to be there. So with this, I've got one minute left. Let's see what we can get. Ooh, don't like that. Let's try it on there. Well, I think that's going to have to be. It needs a bit more contrast to it. And bring that up. Let's get, that's better. And the clarity as well. I think that's getting there. I like the image we're getting here. I've got 37 seconds touch of dehaze on it and a touch of vibrance to bring the colors out. I'd love to do a bit more with that highlight area and I can't quite get it right. Maybe just down a little bit on the whites there. Certainly don't want to crop it. And for those who've been watching for my vignettes on here, no vignette required on this one. Works nicely without it. So just tweak more on the exposure. A bit more saturation. Have I got time? One second. Yes. Ah! And stop. 
Okay. Um, I just realized one thing. I failed to zoom in on the screen, so my apologies for that. That's more or less what I would do with it. And I just wonder, I'm just going to save a snapshot of my edit on here. IMB edit. Right. Uh, let's just toggle between the two and see what the difference is. Gary's edit. Oh, he's managed to get more blue in that sky. My edit. Yeah, that's what I was after. I was after that blue in the sky. I bet. I wonder whether it was D Hayes. Mm. Oh, no, 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 no. I reset that. Right, I'm just going to have a look at Gary's edit. I'm curious now as to how he's done it. Brought. Brought the colours down. Hmm. Oh, brought the blacks down with it. Highlights all the way down, which is what I was doing. And shadows all the way up. Done it that way. So that gives an HDR kind of effect on there. I'd still like to see this area a little bit brighter. Anyway, uh, en enough of me pondering about that image. I'll give some feedback later on in the show. So back to me in the studio. Right, and I'm back. Okay, so now, um, yeah, I found that one a hard edit to do, Gary, um, compared to some. I'll, I'll give the feedback later in a later section. So let's head over to Lightroom because I want to give some feedback to, uh, uh, to John, uh, uh, John K. Barton, who's been posting in the group this week. And hopefully you're watching, uh, John, if not live uh, for the, um, hopefully you'll be watching on the, uh, the replay. Right, there was a number of images that got posted and he was asking for feedback on them. Um, hmm. I thought I had four on that display. Anyway, not to, not to worry. Uh, so let's go over to Lightroom and I'm gonna go into the develop module uh, with uh, uh, with this and just to to talk about these uh, these four images and pull them pull up the um, the film strip down here and shift f give me a bit more screen real estate dum de dum de dum <laughs> don't you just love it when all the tools stop working right Come on, Lightroom. Not that hard. Right, okay, the canal shot. As I was asking for feedback on, on this, I like, um, quite like the shot uh, with it. I think the question I would ask uh, John is, what is the subject for this? What is it that you're trying to, uh, to put over in the shot? And um, and I think something about the framing on this isn't quite right for me. So I'm going to see what happens. What? No, not reference photos. No. Lightroom is playing up. Ah. Oh. Why is the shortcut keys for Lightroom are playing up here? Right, okay. Let's do the cropping this way. Right. I don't know. It feels as though the top isn't adding much to it. Oh, this is ridiculous. I've got the padlock on, yet it's behaving as though the padlock is enabled. A shot. Right, let's try that again. A, disable padlock. That's better. Really sorry about this, folks. Lightroom is not behaving at all today. 
Uh, I'm going to go full screen anyway, so you can see what I'm what I'm doing. But I would try and get the pers the person in the boat on the uh, maybe on the one third line, something like that. And that sort of way, because I don't think the top's adding much to the image. So having a look at that, that's better. Now, um, is the bottom adding much? Do I need to come up? Actually, I think this is probably an image that deserves, if I reset this, I'm just going to completely reset the, the crop on there. And I'm just going to turn it through 90 degrees. Yeah, that's better. I think this image is one that really needs to be landscape port uh, format rather than portrait. And for me, that now works better, um, John, uh, going that way round with it. Uh, it's very, very slightly underexposed. It just needs a little slight tweak to the brightness on there, but not much. I've got a couple of little highlights on there, bring those back down. But I would say that is the answer to that one. Uh, feedback on the next one, which is uh, Blackpool Tower. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I did a live stream all about night photography. And I think I talked about a little bit about night photography last week as well, uh, because uh, one of the, the uh, three minutes edit was a night shot. This shot was taken just a little bit too late. Uh, it really needed to be taken at uh, about 20 minutes after the official sunset time, maybe a few minutes after that. And then you're into that window, we call it the blue light, uh, the, or the blue hour. It's actually about 20 minutes length of time, where the artificial light matches the fading daylight, and you'll get that lovely blue sky. Because what we've got here is the lights on the tower, uh, to my mind, look a little bit blown out. They're right at the edge of their, uh, their brightness on there, and we've lost the detail elsewhere. So if that was shot a little earlier in the evening, that detail wouldn't be lost on there. Uh, so that's the advice on that one. This next one was the one that caused a fair bit of debate on the group during the week. It was, is the horizon tilting or not on here? Uh, I would say it is. It appears to be tilting um, for me. I'm just going to zoom in. And there we can see our horizon line. And what I would do is I would do a crop. Ah, oh, yes, it has given me that rather than the, um, the other ones. And I'm just going to put a marker across there that follows that horizon, which appears to be along there, like that. And we can see that's giving it a slight tilt to correct that. And zoom out. Now, the other thing with this, John, is a lovely shot, great time of day, but this goes back to that question of what's our subject? And our subject here really is the pier. And the problem is it's been bullseyed. And bullseyeing um, your subject usually is not the best way to go. So what I would do with this is I would recrop this image. I think the ripples in the sand are important to it, but this top part of the sky up here probably isn't. So I think we can afford to lose quite a bit of that sky. And over on this side, how much is that adding to it? Where our subject is the pier, I think we can probably bring that in just a little bit. And I'd be happier with that kind of cropping on it and that kind of framing, where we've got the ripples down here acting as a frame. We've got uh, the pier on a one third line, 
we've got the clouds acting as uh, lead-in lines as well, which are mirrored down in the water. So I think that's a much better composition for this uh, done that way. So moving on to John's final one that he was asking for feedback on. I think it's an interesting shot. The choice was to go black and white with it. It's another canal shot. And one of the things I like about it is the, the rain droplets in the water. I think that's really nice with this shot. And Um, so it looks and works well for me on there. Do we need all the sky? I'm not sure on this. I know this has been cropped down. What I don't know is whether it's been cropped from a horizontal or from a vertical uh, image. What I do like is this mirroring effect of the tree and its reflection. I'm going to try a, um, a different crop with it, but I'm not sure this is going to work uh, on here. If I went down like that, how does that look? Possibly. One suggestion was to come up and make it into some more, much more of a panorama um, shot, which I think could work. And that's an interesting sort of uh, way of doing it. I would do one slight tweak with that as a panorama. Do you see this little bit of white here? Just bring that in very, very slightly on there. That also works. I actually quite like that as a panorama um, that way uh, because we've got these lead-in lines. We've still got the reflections. I'm just going to undo that back to the original crop on there. I think that crop does work, but I think there are variants that we could work with on that. Uh, one thing I would watch though, and I'm sure it's not my monitor, but some of these blacks are looking a little bit plugged up. So I'd like to try and see a little bit more light in those areas. We still want a true black on there, but we don't want them completely plugged up. So I tend to do that and maybe and the contrast is fine. Let's touch more on the clarity. Something like that, just to help bring out the black and white conversion on there. Uh, doing black and white conversions is a, a topic of it in its own right. And um, at some point, I, I probably ought to do that as one of the live streams, and let's just concentrate on black and white images. How do they work? Why do they work? And things like that. Uh, so that's the feedback uh, on those, John. I don't know whether you're watching. Hope you find it helpful. Uh, if you're watching it on the replay, um, do let me know whether you've watched it and if you found it helpful uh, on, the, on that. So let me go back to my normal display. And whilst that's on there, I need to try and, try and do something with this, with this copy of Lightroom. Yeah, come on, behave yourself, Lightroom. Yeah. Right, yes, here we go. Uh, yeah, uh, people are sort of commenting here. I, um, ah, right, okay, yep. Um, uh, Andy is saying using X, control and X. Uh, yeah, I, I can't, unfortunately, one thing I can't see is the comments when I'm in full screen, in uh, Lightroom mode on, on here. But there's definitely something odd with Lightroom tonight because I was having fun with it. I'd recorded the three minute challenge shortly before uh, going on air tonight. Um, so that was, and it was behaving oddly at that point. So there's some, definitely something up with it. But yeah, ah, right, Dimitri was asking about the images of the model at the different focal lengths. Um, the aim was to try and sh what I was doing with that is I was walking. F I can't remember which way round I shot them. I think I started with a 300 millimeter and wor worked in and I got as far away as I could with that uh, for it to work. Uh, unfortunately, she kept changing her, uh, her position, which is why it's not perfect. I really need to reshoot that. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure my studio is big enough to be able to do it. 
uh, now because when when I originally shot that it was when I was shooting at home and uh, believe it or not I could get further away from the model at home than I can in the studio uh, with distance set for it so yeah that that would was uh, that hopefully that answers your question Dimitri right okay moving on I've got some more images to share and oh now it's put the extra image on there I don't know what's going on today right let's talk about bokeh and I wanted to share with you a, a, one of uh, Peter's images because he'd shared a bokeh image last week and I didn't really comment on it at that point but what he's done here is he's converted the bokeh instead of being the little round circles into hearts behind this Christmas bear I'm going to explain how that was done with some of my images in a short while so let's look at bokeh uh, as part of um, uh, how we can use a lens to be creative with the images that we do. Now we tend to think of bokeh as images that look like this, which is just these pools of light, both in the foreground and the background out of focus. This is very simply a rotary washing line in the... Um... Oh, right, not yours, Peter. Okay, uh, can't remember whose it is then. My apology um, to whoever's image it is. Um, I thought it was one of Peter's um, on that um, in there. Right, so anyway, back to bokeh. We've got this, uh, this bokeh effect here. It's a rotary line, shallow depth of field, and the things which are out of focus are going, are creating these blobs. And we can use that creatively to create abstracts like this or even something like this. That is actually a set of Christmas lights. And I've just photographed it out of focus and it's just created these pools of, of, of light, these circles of light, which uh, is the same as the, uh, the diaphragm on my lens. It's the shape of the diaphragm on the lens. But often we use bokeh and we think of bokeh as being the out of focus pools of light in images. So for example in this one we've got the leaves in sharp focus but if you look at the pool the little speckles of light in the background we can see those overlapping circles that's the bokeh effect in there and it just gives this lovely background. How do we achieve it? We really go to our widest aperture, smallest f number for it and you want there to be something quite a long way away out of focus. It works better with, I suppose, um, medium telephoto and telephoto lenses. Uh, you can achieve it with normal lenses as well. Once you start getting into wide angles, it's, it's much harder to get a bokeh effect because the depth of field is so wide. So it tends to be more um, medium telephoto and above uh, for it as I was using here with this with this shot and again you can see it on this one of the ferns those circles of light in the background and those match the uh, uh, the leaves in the diaphragm so in the two shots we've just seen it's been completely open now if I'd stop down just slightly you might see almost um, uh, pentagonal shape or however many leaves form the iris in the uh, um, uh, for the for the aperture for the diaphragm and you can see the shape of that now the fact that you can see the shape of that in the bokeh means we can use that to create other interesting shapes so something like this how did we do it how did we get the bokeh to look like a question mark well, quite simply, it's a mask that goes over the lens. This is my Nifty 50 uh, f1.8 lens. And all I've done is I've cut a circle of black card and with a craft knife, I've cut out a hole in the shape of a star and I've put card around the outside so it just slots over my lens. And when I use that 
to take a shot, a standard bokeh shot, that's the effect that I get. And I used it for one of my Christmas cards uh, a few years back, and that was the way I achieved it. It's just Christmas lights a long way in the distance so that they are well out of focus, but because I got that mask over the front of the lens, it created this star effect. And we can use different types of mask on there. So here I got hearts and again, a string of Christmas lights way, way into the background. And I just lined things up in camera. So the string of lights looked like a whole load of hearts bubbling up out of the glass that the model was holding and I lit the model independent. It was a long exposure for the, for the, the Christmas lights, but then uh, we had a single flash go off. Yeah, I think it was a single flash, uh, just to illuminate the model in the foreground. It looks like I was using a softbox on there. And the thing. So, right, now let's move on to some images from, uh, from Andy, who... Um, uh, says that he just takes photos for his own bene benefit. And again, great examples of bokeh here, that out of focus effect, there's the, those um, pools of light in this uh, shot of, which I think are green finches, Andy. Uh, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I often am with identifying them. I think they're green finches, although they do look quite yellow on there. Or are they yellow hammers? I don't know. Anyway, it's one feeding its young on there. And that's a really nice shot, lovely, sharp, in focus. And it's posted up on the, um, uh, on the website, uh, on the uh, YouTube page. And another one that uh, Andy has shared is this one of uh, an eagle, which I take it was at um, a flying display uh, for uh, birds of prey uh, from the... Uh, uh, because we can see the fasteners on the uh, on the the ankles of the bird. Now, that one you possibly couldn't see, but what I'm spotting ah is on this it's on this one. You may not be able to see it uh, on the video, but with some of the processing that you're doing, Andy, and you've got we've got I love these bird images. They're lovely and sharp. I love the composition on this one, that strong diagonal on there, really, really like it. But a little bit of feedback for you, you just need to be a little more careful with some of the, the adjustments because you're starting to get halo effects uh, around the birds. Uh, this one is just about visible on the, the upper wing. The next one here, it's very, very visible. Uh, there's a white line around the outside of the wing. What I'm going to do um, is I'm going to try and open that in, uh, in Photoshop and show you in there. So I need to get rid of Lightroom first, if Lightroom will allow me to do that. Yes, I do want to quit. All right, on there. Let me go to the folder that's got the image in is this one that's going to take a couple of moments just to open and once it's there i'll then switch the monitor over to it so that you can see what i'm doing on this um, what i want to show you andy is um sometimes i know you to get the detail on the bird you need to really pump up those shadows um, uh, to to do it, but you, there's the danger with that halo uh, appearing, particularly if you've done adjustments to the blues as well um, with it. And it's all taking a little while to come up on the screen. dum de dum de dum Right, I shall move the display over to it, which isn't terribly interesting at the moment, but we will get there uh, on this. And now we can see see the effect of this. If I just zoom in, see the, the edge there. Um, and if I can see that on a Facebook version, then 
I know it's going to be there on the, the original as well. But do not despair because there is a really easy fix for it. And that is if you've got Photoshop, I think this might be possible with Photoshop Elements as well. We're going to use the clone brush, clone stamp tool. And I'm going to use the brackets the, uh, just to make that much smaller because I want it nice, relatively small there. And instead of normal mode, I am going to say I just want darken mode on here. I'm going to sample for some, from somewhere fairly near where I need to fix. So I've sampled there by holding the Alt key down and clicking. And now as I go over here, because I've got darken, it's only affecting the white edge. I need to just keep select, reselecting as I'm going through. And you can see we're getting rid of that white edge. Ah, my, opac my opacity is low. So take that all the way up, redo that. And you can see it's just getting rid of the white edge without affecting the bird at all. And it's a nice, easy fix for halos. I come all the way down. I'm holding the space bar moving up. I think that's all of it on that side. And we've got just a little, whoa. <laughs> Pick from this side, of course. Now I can just get rid of it along the edge here as well. So that's the um, the solution to that one. I won't go through the whole image on uh, on there, uh, Andy. Uh, let me just move that down. Siskin, Siskin. A red kite and a white-tailed sea eagle, apparently. And again, fantastic shots here, Andy. And um, I really like your composition on there. It's just... And please take this in context. You've got images here of birds that I just wish I'd be able to create. So they're far better than I can do. So what I'm picking up is nitpicks to try and take this to the next level for you. They're already brilliant. I want them to be brilliant plus uh, on there. Um, so just watch that post-processing in there. Um, what would be interesting, I know we've, we've chatted in the, um, uh, in the live chat, about you submitting some images for the three minute challenge. If you've got one of these bird images that you need editing doing on, that needs editing doing on it, then that might be a good image to submit for the, uh, for the three minute challenge. And we'll, we'll, see what, um, we'll see what Rick makes of that. Um, he's, um, he, he always says he's, he, his genre is portraiture and take him outside of that and um, it's not his area. So let's see what he makes of wildlife. No, I don't know whether, whether that's possible, Andy, but uh, yeah, there are a few things on there. Just be a little bit careful with some of that editing. I suspect it feels as though things are just being pushed a little bit too far and maybe a little more gentle approach on the edit will help with that. But the actual photography on there is, is brilliant, it really is. I really love seeing your bird images. Um, and the fact that you can actually name them as well is even better in my book. Oh dear, I didn't think you were on the stream, uh, and uh, Rick. I thought you weren't watching tonight. Uh, oh dear, right, okay. <laughs> He heard what I was saying about uh, his um, uh, about him uh, uh, about wildlife not being in his comfort zone. But yeah, yeah. Pu let's push both our comfort zones on it. I'm, I'm. That's what it's about. It's not about um, just being able to do the same things over and over again. We need a challenge, and that's why I, I love tonight's. Actually, I love the one that Gary 
game. I did find it a bit tricky to edit, but that's not a bad thing. Um, it'd be boring if every image I could I, I did I got perfect on, it, on there for the challenge. It's not a challenge then. Right. Okay. Let's let's move on. Um, that, oh yes, uh, one final one from Andy. I just like this one. I've got nothing else to say, but I like it. U uses rule of thirds. Lovely composition. And how lucky is that uh, to get um, um, to get an image like that of the dolphins? Whenever I try, I get one tail, or I just get a splash. And I've been on 14 cruises as a photographer, and I still don't have a shot like that. Yeah, you know, they all hide when I get my camera out. All the wildlife does. Right. Three minute challenge. Let me play in Rick's feedback. Um, and now he's here and I'll go and hide before he goes and beats me up. At least he's not in the studio opposite, so he can't come and attack me for uh, taking his name in vain. Right. Let's play his, um, uh, play his video in. OK, and I'm back with some feedback, back with feedback. OK, fair enough. Right. So um, I do actually like this image. Uh, if we have a look at the crop tool just quickly and we'll cycle through the different crops, we can see that nice and level really on the line because it's often very difficult to judge which um, straight line, if you will, which vertical, which horizontal to, to go off when you're trying to balance out a frame. Um, you know, let alone when you're kind of shooting a little bit up towards something that's obviously taller than you are. Um, if you were that tall, you'd be huge. Um, so well done on that. I don't feel that I need to do any kind of straightening really um, to this. It can be tempting to jump into the crop tool and do straightening on things like this because your eye can be fooled by so many horizontals and verticals going on through the frame. I'm pointing at my screen for no reason. You can't see it. Right. Um, I do. I like the reflection elements here. Um, obviously, um, if you didn't want that in, me, in the image, then you would need a polarizing filter. Um, if memory serves me correctly, don't use those things a lot, but that would do the trick. Um, but I don't mind it being in there at all. Um, obviously, it's a little bit kind of wavy um, as it's in glass with, uh, I don't know what kind of coverings on there, uh, but don't mind it at all. I may have been tempted, if I was doing a bit more on this, to retouch the lamppost reflection out there because um, it doesn't really add anything. It just kind of distracts your eye as you're looking around the image. Um, so I'll probably get rid of that and possibly get rid of the uh, trail there from the plane uh, at that point. Um, yeah, I do like it. Um, I like all the graphical shapes and the play of light and shadow. Um, some interesting composition. Um, there's definitely more to be had within there, no doubt, you know, with some other lens choices as well, um, to pick different elements out of the buildings, just concentrating on the graphic side of things um, and the shapes. Um, but most certainly it works. I can't think where that building that is. Um, there's probably something quite interesting there. Now, um, the main bit of feedback I've got, overall, I like the image. Um, it works for me. Uh, I, I am drawn to these graphic shape images and providing balance in the composition even when doing portraiture if you've got these kind of elements possibly as a background um, you know it works well uh, graphical shapes through windows frames doors building structures overhangs it, loads of potential really and um, on this you've shot this at um 70 millimeter the long end of the lens fine nothing wrong with that um iso 100 fine it's a sunny day no reason not to at 28 two thousandth of a second why at 2.8? Um, I mean, it's sharp enough, but uh, it could be improved by going down to, say, f4, 5.6. You could have gone up to 500th of a second at 5.6, still plenty fast enough for hand holding. Um, and you'd have had, you know, a greater depth of field, more tightness and sharpness in the image um, to show for it um, at that point. I think that shooting something like this at 2.8. Um, if you're going to show it large um, on the web or if you're going to print it, say, large, um, you know, going up to 11 by 14, 18 by 12 would be an 83 by 2, then it's going to show a little bit. So I'd rather see it stop down. Now, obviously, we could do a bit of cleanup on the image, um, taking some of the marks off the buildings, which, 
you know, if you wanted to do something with the image or present it, yeah, I'm sure, you know, you'd do that. Um, but overall, nicely done. Um, it does kind of make you wonder when you start looking at shots like this, which are showing a load of windows and buildings of what companies are in there, who lives there, what goes on behind the windows. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Now, don't go looking through people's windows with a lens and a camera sat in a tree because you get arrested for that stuff. But um, overall, I like it. I would have just stopped down to get a sharper image. Um, you know, better quality images and result in the sharpness. Um, there's no real reason to shoot this, something like this wide open, to be honest with you. Um, I know lenses are good these days, wide open, but they're still better when you stop them down. And I think this subject matter really calls for it, um, to be honest with you. But overall, great image. Um, thank you very much for sending it in. And I shall head, shall head, no I won't. I shall hand back to Ian. Right, okay, my, my feedback on it. And as, as is often the case, uh, Rick's managed to do most of the feedback before, um, uh, before I, I get here. I disagree with Rick about the need for correcting the verticals uh, on that. I, I'd I like to see the verticals corrected. I, I was gonna show this in Lightroom, but because I've gone into Photoshop, I've closed down Lightroom and as, the things complaining about drop frames, well, not complaining about drop frames, but saying there's not enough, um, uh, not receiving enough video to remake, to uh, stream smoothly. I don't want to put any more load on the, the laptop, so I'm not going to try firing up Lightroom, because Lightroom gets, uh, is pretty intensive when it's, um, uh, when it's starting up on there. Uh, so I can't go back into Lightroom to bring the image up again. But Rick's covered most things. I do think those verticals need to be vertical. I noticed, uh, Gary, that you had actually done that yourself anyway. Uh, so that's good. Um, I like the composition with it. I like those sorts of buildings. And one thing I don't know whether you tried is maybe just concentrate on the section where the reflections are uh, so that it's nothing but that reflected building where that effectively becomes a distorted reflection that might have been an interesting shot with it the processing looked okay it was slightly underexposed i would shoot at f8 for something like that though that's when your lens is going to be at its sharpest uh, there's no point in going for a shallow depth of field with it it's one of those that if anything, you want a wide depth of field, but don't go too far because you start to get, your lenses aren't quite as sharp beyond F11. So F8 to F11 is where your lens is gonna be at its sharpest. It's gonna cover the, uh, the depth of field that you need with that shot. So just think about that. Uh, I think that's about all I want to say on it. Uh, Rick seems to have covered just about everything else on that, uh, that particular image. Ah, the not enough data message has finally disappeared. Right, what have we got in chat? Any more questions for the final bit of Q&A? I look through here. Can't see anything else uh, in it. Any other questions? No. Okay, so if you have got questions, folks, um, stick them in comments or emails. I'll deal with them uh, next week. Still haven't forgotten the, uh, the issue of lens cleaning. I'm trying to work out how best to, to do that one. Need to get a second camera in to do that one uh, on there. Right, new images in the Facebook group. The answer to that is yes, there are, because I've seen them. Let me go over there and have a look. Refresh my screen and I'll, once it's refreshed, I shall show it to everyone else. Right. So, here we go in the Facebook group. And Dimitri has shared an image whilst we've been on air, uh, which is a cracking ballet shot uh, with shallow depth of field, a sort of, a sort of bokeh effect in the foreground, but also there's a, I think there's a, it looks like there's a, hmm, 
I saw the foreshortening going on with that. I bet she isn't as close to that window as she appears on that shot. So, uh, yeah, nice, nice image that. Let's have a, have a look at it full screen. Yeah, like that. Really do. Lovely and sharp. Thank you for sharing that one, Dimitri. What else have we got? Uh, Peter has shared a, a butterfly. Again, we've got this uh, sort of bucky effect of the flowers in the background. Not sure about the white area underneath on that, but uh, an interesting shot of the butterfly on there. Now, I'm, I need to correct who the photo of um, the teddy bear was. Right, okay, whose was it? I thought it was Peter's. Ah, it's the other Peter. It's Peter Stanford who um, um, who uh, um, who it was. So it was Peter S. I was right. Just a different Peter S. So sorry for confusing the two of you there uh, on that one. Right, and it's a lovely shot uh, with the, uh, the the bokeh uh, on there. Right, let's head. Head back to uh, here and move on. Yeah, the end of the uh, end of another show. So I need to go and have a look at the chat so I can get to that. Oh bother! I've I've gone full screen over here and I shouldn't have. Right, right. Have a look in the chat. Right. Yes. Um, Uh, four short, uh, yeah, pretty much our shot. It's about a foot from the window, apparently, according to Dimitri, the, the ballet shot. Still lovely, lovely image uh, on there. So thank you, everyone, for contributing, for being part of it. Thanks to Rick, as ever, for, uh, for doing the three-minute edits uh, on that. And thank you to everyone who's taken part, allowed me to uh, rub it on about your, uh, your images. It's been, uh, been fun, as ever. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and my other channels if you, they're of relevance to you. So the Lightroom channel and the Travel Photography channel. Comment on videos when you watch them. Uh, share your images. If, you, if um, Terry is saying he wants to try out some of these things. So when you do, Terry, stick them in the um, uh, Facebook group so we can have a look at them and see how you're getting on with that. And don't forget to like. There's 20 of you watching, only nine of you have liked it. Come on, the other 11 of you, hit that like button. You know you want to. Next week, Lightroom. We are back to Lightroom. These are all the things I had planned for the Lightroom one a few weeks ago and ran out of time for, plus a couple of other extras uh, in there. So this week, in the Facebook group, please post images where there's something special that you've done in Lightroom on there to sort of show the techniques in Lightroom and things like that. Or post images that you think would benefit from uh, having some work done in Lightroom. And I'll pick one or two, uh, as I have done the last couple of weeks, to, uh, to provide some feedback and perhaps play around with them a little bit in Lightroom uh, outside of the um, uh, three minute edit challenge. So, uh, as ever, thanks for watching, and until next time, keep making great photos. Bye for now, folks. <laughs>
Now, if you want to see the full version, you'll have to join my academy. The details are on the screen there. It's only £6 a month or uh, £60 a year. Great way to support uh, what we're doing here. The full versions do stay up here on, live, on YouTube for quite a while. And we do have the extracts on here. But if that's not enough for you, or you just want to say thank you and want to support uh, what I'm doing with these uh, live streams, then consider joining the Academy. The link to all of that is down below in the description. So until next time, folks, thanks for watching and uh, keep making great photos. I'll see you next time.